All right, so I apologize for my voice sounding this way. Um, it's great to be recorded while I'm sick, but um, so, um, and thanks again for letting me speak about this. Um, it's something that I think you guys um, probably have a lot of questions about. Um, and one of those diagnoses that it can really make or break management in a patient, but it is very, very rare. So I kind of want to talk about how to appropriately um, consider it, when to um, do testing, how to, how to treat, et cetera. Um, so for those of you who've had this lecture before, I apologize. Um, it didn't change much, but it'll be a good refresher. So, and by the way, I'm Dr. Ravel, which he said, but I'm one of the um, faculty in the Division of Endocrinology. So these are kind of the things in the sections we're gonna go through today. Um, and of course, please like, please feel free to interrupt me and ask questions anytime. It's completely informal. Um, and it will help me give my voice a break too, so I appreciate interruptions. So firstly, we have to talk about what adrenal insufficiency really is. Um, and basically, it means at some level, whether it's at the hypothalamus, pituitary gland, or through the adrenal gland, there's failure to produce an adequate amounts of cortisol, plus or minus mineralocorticoid, depending on if this is a primary or secondary adrenal insufficiency. So this is like an overview of the adrenal gland um, and what it does. You guys all know this. You know your um, GFR, glomerulosa, fasciculata, reticularis, and the things that they produce. Um, and so um, obviously a very important gland. Um, so diagnosing dysfunction is important. Um, the normal HP adrenal axis is that um, there is CRH uh, made from the hypothalamus, which is going to speak to the anterior pituitary to make ACTH. ACTH will then speak to the adrenal gland and stimulate multiple layers of the adrenal gland. So it's going to stimulate cortisol production um, from the fasciculata and reticularis. It's going to um, stimulate uh, weak androgen production from those same layers as well, and it's also going to have a role in producing um, catecholamines as well. So in primary adrenal insufficiency, that means the problem is with the adrenal gland itself. So the adrenal gland might be receiving all the signals in the world from the pituitary, but it's just kind of ignoring them and is not able to make um, cortisol, it's not able to make um, your DHEAS, um, it's not able to make um, mineral corticoid, and what you'll see on testing is you'll have a low cortisol, a high ACTH, and a high DHEAS as well because you're still having ACTH speaking to the um, adrenal gland and you can still make those weak androgens, um, but you can't make the cortisol. In secondary AI, um, the problem is actually at the pituitary or hypothalamic level, so everything is gonna be low and that's gonna be important when you do your testing to figure out which layer, especially as there's more common uh, use of immune checkpoint inhibitors for cancer, we are seeing a higher incidence of autoimmune um, and immune checkpoint inhibitor um, um, adrenal insufficiency at the pituitary level. So primary adrenal insufficiency is going to present in a way um, um, because of the low cortisol and low mineralocorticoid, you're going to see weakness, fatigue, anorexia. They're going to complain about nausea and vomiting, and these symptoms in red are really the symptoms of mineralocorticoid deficiency rather than cortisol deficiency. Um, other symptoms that commonly happen like salt cravings, postural dizziness, um, menstrual irregularities are kind of hit or miss, but the most common are those top three. And things that you can see on exam or in taking further histories that they've had unintentional weight loss. They may be hyperpigmented due to the um, unopposed ACTH production um, and then downstream melanin production and they may be hypotensive. A lot of times autoimmune deficiencies tend to run together. Um, so if they do have an autoimmune cause for the primary adrenal insufficiency, you might also see vitiligo and other um, skin conditions. And then lab findings that are common, again, because there's lack of mineralocorticoid and cortisol, you can see hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, and azotemia are the most common. Secondary AI might be very similar but you're not gonna have those um, symptoms of um, orthostatic hypotension. You're not gonna have salt craving um, like you would when you're lacking mineralocorticoid because only the cortisol is deficient. Same thing, they can have unintentional weight loss, but they won't have any of those other signs usually. And lab findings are very nonspecific as far as your general electrolyte panel, your general renal function, et cetera. 
So known causes of AI. In primary, the most common um, in the developed world is autoimmune um, adrenal insufficiency or Addison's disease. Um, and so a lot of times it might be associated with what we call APS2, which is called Schmidt syndrome. Um, and it's a cluster of autoimmune conditions. It might also be isolated, where only the adrenal gland is affected. It might be part of APS type 1 um, as well. Um, in the non-developed world, the most common cause of primary AI would be infiltrating infectious diseases, such as tuberculosis, etc. It can also be a result of CAH, um, most commonly because of 21-hydroxylase deficiency. And then, again, less common in, for us, but in other places in the world you might see, are um, just widespread infection affecting the adrenal gland, metastatic tumors, um, a result of surgery, um, a result of hemorrhage, such as um, with like where Waterhouse Friedrichsen syndrome, or if someone's on therapeutic anticoagulation and they have hemorrhage into their adrenal glands. Um, and then there are some um, medications um, that are not commonly used but can cause adrenal insufficiency, such as um, ketoconazole, mitotain, phenytoin, rifampin, and checkpoint inhibitors for cancer. Secondary AI, um, most of the time, is due to suppression of the HPA access by steroids, so things that we cause the patients. Um, and this can happen at a dose of 5 milligrams prednisone or equivalent um, over more than three weeks. And then additionally, you can have tumors that take up space um, in the cellar region um, that cause lack of ACTH production um, because of um, just taking up um, space in there. Um, you could have METs to the pituitary gland, which are very, very uncommon and very cool cases. If you ever get one, definitely write it up. Uh, but melanoma can go to the pituitary gland, for example. Having pituitary surgery obviously can cause pituitary dysfunction and deficiency. And then um, opioid-induced adrenal insufficiency is something else that's very common um, nowadays. And then radi any radiation to the um, cellar region additionally can cause adrenal insufficiency. I think I forgot, there we go. Less common things would be lymphocytic hypophysitis. Um, again, infections that go to the pituitary gland. Um, infiltrative diseases like sarcoid and histiocytosis don't usually go there. Um, if histiocytosis does affect the pituitary, usually you're gonna see not necessarily pituitary hormone deficiency, but you're gonna see diabetes insipidus because it's gonna affect the stock more so. Um, and then of course, you can again have hemorrhage into the pituitary gland, uh, which we call pituitary apoplexy. And like we said before, immune checkpoint inhibitors for cancer can cause ACTH deficiency. So now we get to the part that's most important. Um, when should we consider adrenal insufficiency and how do we test for it? Um, you know, there are a couple of people that are considered gurus in the world of adrenal medicine. One of them is Richard Aukis and one of them is um, Dr. Bill Young. Um, and they both advocate for not even testing cortisol levels if someone's in the hospital. Cortisol is affected by many, many things. And it takes um, a very severely ill person ooh, sorry, to lose the diurnal um, kind of pattern of cortisol and to be able to randomly test the cortisol and have it be diagnostic. That being said, it's very tempting to check cortisol a lot. When your patient is hypotensive, you can't wean the pressors, they have unexplained hypokalemia or hyponatremia, et cetera. Um, it's very, very tempting and I understand that. So we're gonna talk about times that maybe you should test it or it might be okay to test it and when you definitely should not. So again, let's remember the diurnal variation of cortisol secretion and how it normally goes. So to wake us all up, um, around, you know, um, starting around 5 a.m. and peaking at 8 a.m., we have a very rapid rise in our cortisol levels. And um, the nadir cortisol levels around midnight. Um, we have another small bump in the afternoon um, around 2, 3 p.m., um, maybe to help us get through our post-lunch coma, but um, those are kind of the usual blips in cortisol. And so when you're testing cortisol, kind of remember this, and if you can at all, if possible, try to get the cortisol level between 7 and 9 a.m. as close as you can. Really, we want 8 a.m., but it's not always possible. And when you order labs in the hospital, don't order as a next a.m. and draw it at 4 a.m. Um, make sure you time it for 8, okay? All right. 
another thing to consider is how cortisol travels through the blood and the body and what tests we actually do so when we check a serum cortisol level we're checking the total cortisol so that means how much cortisol is um, uh, free how much is bound to cortisol binding globulin how much is bound to albumin all of it so in essence that's going to be affected by how much albumin and cortisol binding globulin a person has um, several things affect the levels of those the most common that i've seen in the hospital is cirrhosis so patients with cirrhosis have very low albumin and cbg therefore when you check a cortisol level um, at 8 a.m., it might still be low and not reflective of their actual cortisol concentration because we're not accounting for that low protein state. So do keep that in mind. Additional um, things that might affect CBG um, in the other direction and cause increased cortisol binding globulin and therefore falsely higher cortisol levels are anything that induces increased estrogen levels like birth control um, or hormone replacement therapy um, or pregnancy. Additionally, um, other things can affect our cortisol concentration, even if we're over otherwise healthy. So things like um, psychiatric disease can affect cortisol levels. Um, things such as um, anti-epileptic drugs can affect our cortisol levels, like phenytoin, et cetera. Um, and things like um, alcoholism and anorexia nervosa can affect our CBG levels and therefore our cortisol. So if any of these things are present, it's not a good idea to check cortisol or you should really, really avoid doing it. Um, all right, there is a free cortisol assay, but it's not widely available and it's not really great to interpret. Um, so we don't usually check free cortisol. All right, so again, this is just a summary of things that can affect your CBG levels, either making CBG higher than um, normal or lower. So I'll let you guys look over that another time. All right, so when do we test? So again, an 8 a.m. cortisol. I want you to have dreams about me saying this. 8 a.m. cortisol is the time that we check it, okay? Um, and basically, according to the old assays, we have certain cutoffs for when we think, okay, this might be abnormal. Um, most recently, I saw a lecture by Dr. Aukis, and he talked about a cortisol level of four, he said. So the cortisol is four. Um, at 8 a.m., he doesn't even bother testing for adrenal insufficiency. It's good. Um, that being said, um, we kind of are not so confident in our knowledge, so we are like, okay, maybe not four, but definitely something that's less than four, we want to be concerned for adrenal insufficiency. Anything greater than 18, again, keeping in mind um, accounting for CBG and albumin and all those things. 18 is a relative number, but anything in the high teens should, should make you very um, confident that this person does not have adrenal insufficiency. On the newer assays that we have, actually 14 is the cutoff, so even lower. So if it's more than 14, um, then you can probably skip on the cosentropin stim testing, and you probably don't need to give them extra steroids. Um, the other thing I want to um, emphasize is if you're checking a cortisol, please, please, please make sure the patient's not already on steroids. It's happened several, several times that someone's on Dex or someone's on prednisone or something like that, and then they have a cortisol level that's abnormal, um, and then they're stimmed, and the stim's not going to tell us much because they're already on steroids. They're already taking something that's suppressing their natural response. So please do a thorough medication review before doing a stim test. All right, so cosentropin stim testing. In endocrinology, if something, if we think something's low, we're going to try and make it high. And so if we think cortisol production's low, we need to give the patient something that should normally stimulate cortisol production, which is ACTH. So we use cosentropin, which is an um, um, analog of that, and you're going to give them 250 micrograms. Um, first thing you want to do is check their ADM cortisol. So that brings us back to the fact that cosentropin stim testing should be done at 8 a.m. Uh, and not in the afternoon, not in the evening, definitely not at midnight, because um, also it's mean to the patient. It's a lot of blood draws and everything, so um, that, that aside. Um, so an 8 a.m. cortisol level. And if you want, you can throw in an ACTH as well. Um, you're going to give them the cosentropin immediately after that blood draw. And then at 30 minutes and 60 minutes, we're going to check our cortisol level again. Our goal is that we should see that cortisol level go above our high cutoff, which I think should be 14, but it could be 18, according to the old school um, method of thinking. Again, keeping in mind, 
if they're 17.3 after they get cosentropin, probably they still don't have AI. So um, there's no absolute cutoff in that sense. All right, and then um, the other thing is if they don't stim above your high cutoff, you're looking for at least a delta of 10. So from their baseline until their max value, whether it's at 30 or 60 minutes, if they've increased their cortisol by more than 10, they have pretty good adrenal function. So the problem, therefore, is not primary adrenal insufficiency. It's not that the adrenal gland cannot make cortisol. It might be that just there's ACTH suppression for some reason, and that's why their first cortisol level was low. Any questions about that so far? Okay, cool. Um, a note about steroids. So patients that um, are on steroids, again, it's going to affect this testing. The exception being this. There are sometimes situations where someone's hypotensive. They have all kinds of crazy electrolyte derangements. Um, you're having trouble controlling their MAP and everything like that, despite max pressors, and you're like, should I put them on steroids? Um, the answer is always, if you think it's going to benefit the patient, the risk of giving them like hydrocortisone or something similar is so low in that situation that you might as well just do it. Um, if you have to slowly wean them off and do testing later, you can do so, but definitely don't hold steroids in a situation you think that it might be helpful. If someone, if you really want to check the cortisol before you do it, the best thing to do is actually give them a dose of dexamethasone because it takes um, up to eight hours for it to reach its peak and really suppress cortisol. So you can give them a shot of dex to support their blood pressure, check the cortisol within an hour or two of that dex and you're still safe. All right, so that's the only one that doesn't cross-react with the cortisol assay right away. All right. The other thing when interpreting cosentropin stim in the hospital is really check um, the nurse's understanding of what's going to be done first. Um, there are like free text kind of order sets that we've written um, that I'm happy to share with anyone. Um, you know, that you can make to your own favorites um, to explain the, the steps involved. And now we have a um, smart set um, in Jewish and UFL for cosentropin and stim testing. So those are available for your use. Um, the second thing is whenever you get the results, check the timing of the blood draws and look at when they actually gave the cosentropin. I can't tell you the number of times that someone's had a completely flat cosentropin stim test and then the cosentropin was actually given like four hours later. So before you get too worried, just double check those things, okay? All right, so here again is a schema about the interpretation. Um, and so these numbers, like I said, are kind of relative, but four should be a number you remember. Less than four cortisol, you should probably think about doing a stim test, if appropriate, and if not on steroids. Um, and then if it's um, more than, um, I would say actually like 9, 10 um, baseline cortisol, I wouldn't stim them um, and I wouldn't do further testing. If something's abnormal um, and you're really not sure, you could always ask us, um, you know, um, but the other thing is start steroids. It's okay. Give them hydrocort and then have them repeat testing as an outpatient in a couple weeks when things are more stable. Um, that's really the lesser of the evils, is just to support them if you need, but be very careful about documenting a diagnosis of adrenal insufficiency on their chart, um, because that never leaves them. And patients like to stick on to that and be like, oh, I have Addison, and then it's like, no, you really don't, you're okay. Um, so, okay. All right, yeah, so that's just the new cutoff um, reminder. So how do we treat? So if we think this is um, secondary adrenal insufficiency because of ACTH suppression, our main um, treatment is going to be hydrocortisone. And certainly you can use other types of um, steroid as well, um, but hydrocortisone is the most physiologic. The average adult makes about 12 to 13 milligrams of hydrocortin a day whenever they're in good health. Um, again, with those peaks as we talked about before, so a peak around 8 a.m., peak around 2 p.m., the rest of the time pretty low cortisol levels. And so when we give people hydrocortisone, we usually split the dose and we usually tell them to take 10 milligrams with their first meal of the day, which is usually breakfast, and to take five milligrams with lunch or a little bit after lunch to kind of mimic what the body would normally do, okay? In times of stress, anyone with a functioning HPA axis is gonna make extra cortisol to get them through it. 
um, especially during febrile illness. So we have to remind our patients that can't produce their own cortisol response that when they're sick with fever or when they're having a major surgery or they're having a dental procedure or they're um, you know, um, singing the national anthem at like a sporting event or something with a lot, a lot of stress, um, that they should double or triple their dose to get them through that period of time and then they can go back to their normal dose. Um, with mineral corticoid replacement, this is going to be important in people that have actual primary adrenal insufficiency. Um, and so um, usually we use fludrocortisone. You can start at a dose of 0.05 milligrams daily. And if they're still orthostatic on that dose, you can go up to 0.1 milligrams daily. This doesn't have to be doubled in times of stress. Also, anytime we use hydrocortisone or any equivalent steroid at a dose of 50 milligrams or more, it acts as a mineralocorticoid. So when we stress dose our patients in the hospital, we don't have to add fludro as well if they are on it at home. But as soon as the dose goes below 50, we should add back their home fludrocortisone. And then some people do benefit from androgen replacement therapy if they have primary, if they have, um, primary adrenal insufficiency. Um, and it's more to do with like menopausal women and their libido, but there's not, no strong evidence. And I personally have not prescribed this for any patient. All right. So here's our hydrocort, and um, it's important to also keep in mind the equivalency chart. I basically Google this every time I have to do it because I forget, but it's widely available in case you need to convert steroids. Um, but these are equivalent doses. Um, so that's another thing to keep in mind is that when, um, when you're giving someone um, a steroid other than hydrocort, say for another condition, um, say you're giving them um, you know, dex for cerebral edema or something like that, um, an increase in cranial pressure. Keep in mind the equivalent hydrocort dose and how, how many times superphysiologic that is. Um, if someone has secondary adrenal insufficiency, you need to wean them off very, very, very slowly back to their home dose because they're dependent on the ACTH level and you've suppressed it. So um, you want to very, very slowly wean them. Someone that has primary adrenal insufficiency it doesn't matter what their ACTH level is. It always is going to be, um, it's always going to be very high. So um, you don't have to wean them off. So you can treat them with high dose steroids to get them through whatever they're going through and put them right back on their home dose as soon as they're better. And there'll be no issue there. All right, so there are certain um, instances where we have to kind of alter our dosing. Um, and so this is the suggested dosing, which we talked about for glucocorticoids, mineralocorticoids, and sex steroids. Um, and then this is sick day rules, which we already talked about, where we're going to double and triple our dose if we have fever or if we're going for surgery or we're very emotionally stressed. People that have shift work. So this is another consideration because they've lost that normal um, diurnal variation in, in their cortisol production. So I basically do everything based on their wake up and sleep. So if they wake up at 2 p.m. and their first meal is at 4, um, that's when I make them take their 10 milligram higher dose and so on and so forth. So you can mimic the schedule that they um, actually have. If someone is exercising, that is considered stress. So they should do sick day rules um, and they should increase their salt and water intake in preparation um, for the losses. If someone is pregnant, um, this is an estrogen um, high state, so their cortisol binding globulin will be higher, so their free cortisol will be lower because more will be bound. So you want to increase their glucocorticoid doses as the pregnancy goes on. So someone that is pregnant that requires physiologic steroids might need, instead of 10 and 5 milligram doses, might need 20 and 10 or 30 and 20 milligram doses. And really you're going to go based on their symptoms and, and how they're feeling. Um, during dialysis, um, you can give them a little more cortisol in the morning to get them through their dialysis and make sure they don't have hypotension. Um, but um, basically the main thing is once they're end stage renal, they don't require mineralocorticoid replacement anymore. And then in travel, we really don't have to adjust anything. Um, just make sure they have emergency supplies. So anyone that's on oral steroids should be prescribed an IM hydrocortisone dose. It comes as like a pre-filled syringe or a kit, which is called Actovile, uh, but you can also just give them hydrocortisone plain um, because Actovile can be very expensive and 
um, you should counsel your patients that anytime they have like um, illness where they're vomiting continuously and they can't keep down medicine, they should immediately give them a shot of hydrocortisone, either 50 milligrams if they're smaller or 100 milligrams if they're an average sized person and go straight to an emergency room um, because they're gonna need steroids. All right. And then patients with diabetes um, that are on insulin um, sometimes require um, methylprednisolone instead of hydrocortisone because it's a little longer acting. Additionally, people with cirrhosis sometimes require methylprednisolone instead of hydrocortisone. All right, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so what other tests should you do after you've diagnosed adrenal insufficiency? So if you didn't already get an ACTH with your cosyntropin stim testing, you should do so now so you know if it's primary or secondary, so you can advise them whether or not they need mineralocorticoids. Um, and if you think it's primary adrenal insufficiency, we should start looking at the other hormones that are produced by the adrenal glands. So you should definitely check your renin and aldo. Um, you wanna evaluate the cause of the adrenal insufficiency, so you can check for 21 hydroxylase antibodies. And in young boys, you can also check very long chain fatty acids because it may be the first sign or presenting feature of um, the syndrome of adrenal leukodystrophy, which is always on the steps, by the way. That, there's always one question on that, um, even on my endocrine board. So, um, and then in patients that have secondary adrenal insufficiency and they have ACTH deficiency, we want to make sure um, that there aren't any other pituitary hormones that are deficient. So do your full pituitary axis. And if anything seems abnormal, you might want to consider getting a pituitary-directed um, MRI as well. There are a couple syndromes I wanted to talk about also, which um, sometimes make um, cortisol testing difficult. Like I said, patients with cirrhosis, oftentimes their cortisol seems lower than it actually is because of their low albumin, their protein calorie malnutrition, whatever else is going on. But there is a real condition which is called hepatoadrenal syndrome. Um, and um, it's very rare, but of course, having steroid deficiency can cause morbidity and mortality. And so um, basically, again, I use the same logic. If I think someone might have an element of this, and I'm really not sure how to interpret it, they have cirrhosis, they're hypotensive, they're on all the usual things um, for their blood pressure otherwise with cirrhosis, um, a little bit of hydrocort won't hurt them. Um, and so you can always do hydrocort replacement, give them physiologic doses, and give it like three to six months, and then maybe test them again and see if it's still consistent with adrenal insufficiency. Um, just starting someone on steroids um, doesn't mean they have to be on it for life, unless you know they have primary adrenal insufficiency. All right, so um, there are a couple hypotheses as, as to why these patients develop adrenal insufficiency. Um, and a lot of times it has to do with the fact that there might be some like micro um, coagulopathy that's gonna cause infarcts in the adrenal gland and atrophy. Sometimes it's um, something that's adrenal exhaustion. And I smile because the term adrenal fatigue has plagued endocrinologists for the past couple years. It's not a real thing, but there is maybe some overwork of the adrenal gland in cirrhotic patients because they're chronically hypotensive. Um, and so it, that might be a, a potential etiology. Um, and then again, altered CBG levels um, may also um, affect their cortisol. All right, and then again, just like in cirrhosis, um, another condition um, unrelated to the adrenal gland that causes AI is opioid-induced adrenal insufficiency. And this can cause ACTH de de um, deficiency most commonly, but also primary AI as well. And um, Basically, the mainstay here, if you diagnose this, um, based on the way that we talked about, is to give them a physiologic replacement um, while they're on opioids and try to wean them off the opioids if possible, so you can also discontinue steroids. Again, this is an ideal situation. It's not always possible. Okay, all right. So now I want to talk about um, steroid use in acute illness and severe illness. And so um, I think this is a situation most commonly when cortisol is tested in the hospital. Um, and so if someone is having shock and 
you're not able to get them off pressors and everything. There is a role for hydrocortisone at that time, and it's independent of any diagnosis of adrenal insufficiency. Um, so, you know, there are two very popular and well-known trials, approaches, and adrenal, which talk about this. And they looked at the morbidity and mortality of patients that had shock and were treated with either just stress dose hydrocortisone, which is 50 milligrams Q6 or Q8, or hydrocort and fludrocortisone. And they actually found that the patients that received hydrocort and fludrocort actually did better. And they were able to wean them off their pressors faster. So it's okay to use um, stress dose steroids um, during acute illness and, and during shock, but please don't check cortisol. Um, just treat them and get them through it. Um, and most of the time, by the time they're ready to go home from hospital, they don't require steroids anymore. If they're still not able to get off the steroids at time of discharge, um, give them instructions on how to taper it slowly to that physiologic dose, and then have them see us once as an outpatient, and we'll do further testing. All right, so I finished a little early, but any questions? or any cases. Okay, all right. Um, so takeaway points um, that um, I hope you've gotten is that steroids are not our enemy. It's okay to use hydrocort if you need to, but please, um, please check cortisol only if they're not already prescribed steroids. If they've gotten DEX within the past two hours, that's the only time that steroids um, won't affect your cortisol level if at all possible, check it at 8 a.m. And make sure your cosyntropin stim test is very well explained to nursing staff before you order it. All right, thanks guys.